I will uh, go ahead and get started on this lesson about the exclusive nature of commands from uh, and I'll be using a lot of Brother Cantrell's material. If one believes that the Bible is the Word of God, then he ought to use it as his authority. He should go uh, buy it. Uh, there's no use in having a Bible. There's no use in believing it's the Word of God if what it says is going to be ignored. But you have to spend time studying and coming to an understanding of God's commands and what it means when God authorizes. <clears throat> Departures from God's Word have come uh, probably more in this area than any other because people have gone onward and did not abide in the doctrine of Christ like the Bible talks about. Uh, there's an exclusive nature in God's commands. It's uh, something that God specifies. God can command something to be done but does not have to give a great long list of things you should not do. Uh, when you think about the things in the religious world, from uh, the idea of having a pope to all the way to instrumental music and worship, all of these have come under this heading of doing things God has not authorized. And they are all additions to God's word. Psalms 19.13 is uh, what we're going to begin with tonight. This verse in the Old Testament, this is considered to be one of David's psalms. And in verse 13 it says, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Presumptuous sins. <clears throat> it means to presume that because of who God will is, he will overlook our failures to do what he uh, desires. Instead of uh, doing what we want, we are to do what God wants. And so this is basically substituting our will for God's will. And this is really at the very heart of all rebellion uh, against God. So the real issue we're examining is, does, does man, do people respect God's authority? Well, if a person does, then he's only going to do what God commands. So what do I mean by this, and how can we go to the Bible to give examples of this? And we'll uh, give ones that I think are very, very familiar uh, to all Bible students. Uh, most all of us know about the story of Noah and being commanded by God uh, to build an ark for the saving of his household. Noah was told to build the ark of a particular type of wood. The Bible calls it gopher wood in Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> and we'll notice as we read that account that there's no other type of wood that God told Noah to build the ark out of. Therefore, all other kinds of wood were excluded. He told Noah specifically what to make it out of. And if Noah would have uh, made it out of gopher wood plus other kinds of wood, the ark wouldn't have saved anybody. He had to understand that when God said, make it out of gopher wood, that was the only kind that God authorized. Now, if, if later on he would have told them you could also use oak and pine, then those would have been fine too. But he did not. He only authorized one kind. We also see that in uh, the type of worship that Christians are to participate in uh, during our time. He has given certain activities by which he desires to be worshipped. And we find those uh, throughout uh, the New Testament. Singing and praying, uh, giving, in other words, a contribution, observing the Lord's Supper and uh, teaching and listening to God's Word. Those are activities that God has 
specifically authorized for Christians to uh, partake in. <clears throat> and so when we look at those collectively, they become exclusive. Uh, God has commanded singing. We look at that in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 uh, and other places that God has commanded uh, singing. And we look throughout the New Testament at, at, at every book and so forth and we find no other type of music that God has authorized. And so because of the exclusive nature of this, then that's the only type of music that God accepts in worship. And we should respect what he has to say because he is God and we're not. <clears throat> so he has only authorized one. Uh, we understand, and most people understand this in, in things outside the religious world very clearly. We... You, some of us out there probably played the game Simon Says. And there was only really one important rule in that game. You can only do what Simon says. If you do something that Simon didn't say, you're out of the game. And so it was very clear um, how that game was played. Well, God has done the same thing with us when he said that the only type of music he desires in Christian worship is singing, then that means, because he didn't authorize anything else, that any other type of music was sinful. Instrumental music, whistling, humming, playing the drums, whatever. God didn't authorize any of those, so to partake and participate in those is to go against what God has said. Uh, we talked about worship just a minute ago about the ways God desires uh, to worship. And, you know, we talked about singing and praying, uh, giving of our means and, and listening to God's word and partaking in the communion. <clears throat> and we look and see that those were all authorized by God. He didn't authorize dancing as worship, or playing, or counting beads, or lighting candles. So none of those are acceptable to God. Sometimes people call this the silence of Scripture, and that's probably as good a way of looking at it uh, as uh, any other. Uh, a good illustration of this is found in Hebrews chapter 7. And if you have your Bibles available... Uh, I would encourage you to follow along when we look at Hebrews 7, verses 13 and 14. Give you just a second to get there. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. This is what it says in the New King James. <clears throat> this is talking about the priesthood and the need for a new priesthood. Verse 13 says, for he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Now, spoke nothing. Now, nowhere does it say that uh, he couldn't come from another tribe, but because only one tribe was authorized, all the other tribes were eliminated. So Jesus is identified as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's, of course, in the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> and he could not be a priest after the order of Aaron or what we call the Levitical priesthood. And the reason given is that God had spoken and said that the priests were to come from the tribe of Levi. <clears throat> he did not have to say that the priests couldn't come from any of the others. He didn't authorize any others. He only authorized priests from the tribe of Levi. And that was understood. That's why Jesus could not have been a Levitical priest under the law of Moses. In Hebrews 1.5, the writer talks about the special relationship that Jesus has to the Father. Jesus is called the Son of God. 
which means that he is divine. He's, he's deity. He's God. And the writer points out there in Hebrews, points out a quotation, and then argues that God did not say this about angels. So because he did not say it about angels, then angels are not the Son of God. So silence uh, is very critical in understanding what God desires of us. And you, we could look at many, many other examples uh, throughout the Bible <clears throat> to show that God did not speak and say not to. God's command not only tells us what he does want, it also tells us what he does not want. He does not want us to go beyond the, the bounds of God's law. Two verses in the New Testament from the writer John uh, makes this very clear. Please read with me, first of all, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says this, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. See, that's doing something that uh, the law doesn't authorize. He's being lawless, going beyond the law. And then in 2 John, verse 9, the writer says this, Whoever transgresses, which means to go beyond, and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. So in both of those texts, we see the need for only doing what God has authorized. So silence, again, is critical in uh, understanding what God desires of, it, of us. What God is not authorized cannot be a matter of faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, in the Old Testament, there was a statement <clears throat> made by Balaam in Numbers chapter 22, verse 18, that needs to be heeded as well. It says, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. And that's what man has done so much in the religious world today. Either done less or more. <clears throat> Nadab and Abihu are great examples of this in the Old Testament. They uh, were priests that were officiating in the temple. And they offered what Leviticus chapter 10 calls strange fire, or some texts, some translations even use the word unauthorized fire. And because it was unauthorized, they were killed on the spot. Some people might think that was severe, but it wasn't. God had told them specifically where to get the fire from. In other words, this area was specified. This spot was specified. Well, they got it somewhere else. God didn't have to tell them where not to get the fire. He only authorized one place. There was a slogan that came out of the uh, restoration movement called, We speak where the Bible speaks and are silent where the Bible is silent. And that's really kind of a, a summation of what we're talking about uh, this evening. We're to command what the scriptures command, but we're not to command what they don't command. That's wrong. And then the flip side of this, we're only to bind what the scriptures bind, and we're not to bind what they don't bind. <clears throat> we, you know, there's grave dangers both ways. In Matthew 23, 23, this is the chapter where Jesus talks to the Pharisees and the scribes and, and on more than one occasion calls them hypocrites. Why? Well, look at what he says in Matthew 23, 23. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay, pay tithe of men and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. They were doing some of them, and then completely ignoring and neglecting the others. So where the, the scriptures speak, we have obligations. We can't legislate for God. That's arrogance. Uh, so there is this very special 
nature, if you want to use that term, of exclusiveness. The Bible says, we all know John 3.16, man must believe to be saved. There's no doubt about that. Is that man command exclusive? In other words, has God given any other commands for man to do that involves of salvation? If not, then only faith is necessary for man to do. But if there's other commands, then the command to believe is not exclusive. Well, we look throughout the New Testament and we find several other things that God tells men they must do to be saved. Acts 3.19, men must repent to be saved. So therefore, there's two things that man must do to be saved. Neither one could be neglected. Men must confess Christ to be saved. We find that in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. So we th see th there's three things that man must do. Man must also be baptized or immersed to be saved. Acts 2.38 uh, is an example of that. So all of those are said to be essential, not any of them more important than the others. So while not a single one of them excludes the others, but putting all together, they become exclusive. So it's not just faith, it's not just repentance, it's not just confession, it's not just baptism, but it's all of them collectively, if you might say, looking at them as one. Uh, and we kind of talked about how man is to worship God and, and what God uh, has authorized. And we're not supposed to go beyond what God has authorized and expect him to be uh, pleased. As I mentioned, most of the problems in the religious world come from a failure to respect this principle. Uh, so many examples of this throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. King Saul, who was a Benjamite, he, in other words, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. <clears throat> he understood this concept, but he went ahead and acted as a priest and offered sacrifice to God. Now, he had no authority to do that whatsoever. Only priests from Levi were allowed to do that. And because of that, he lost so many things, including his kingdom. Uh, King Isaiah, uh, from the tribe of Judah, he did the same thing. He attempted to fulfill the role of a priest. He burned incense in the temple. Well, Azariah and a number of priests withstood him to the face and said, It is not for you, Isaiah, to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. And Isaiah was smote by God with leprosy. There wasn't any excuse. He knew he had no authority, no right to do that. He went ahead and done it anyway. <clears throat> and you might say, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. What about the God of the New Testament? It's the exact same God. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, he doesn't change uh, in any sense. So, I mean, we understand that in, in our world, you know, a physician writes a, a prescription and gives to the pharmacist, and that uh, prescription <clears throat> says, this is the medicine I want John Doe to take. The pharma, pharmacist knows he is not authorized to give John Doe a bunch of other medicines. In other words, the doctor authorizes one and one only. And the pharmacist has no right or authority to go beyond and give John Doe anything else. Suppose someone among us should uh, attempt to make himself head of the church. He's just going to say, I'm going to be the head of the church. Well, is there a specific command that prohibits that? No. But the Bible clearly states that Jesus is the head of the church. In other words, he's the only one the Bible says can be the head of the church. So that excludes because there's no authority for anyone else, for humans or angels or anybody else. Um, is it biblical to pray to God through Mary, the mother of Jesus? 
The answer is no. But is there a verse that says, Thou shalt not pray to God through Mary? No. But the only person the Bible says we have authority to pray through to God is Jesus himself. 1 Timothy 2, 5. He's the only mediator between God and man. There are no others. So to pray through anyone else is to go beyond. So all other mediators would be excluded. Uh, the same way with infant baptism. Is there a verse that prohibits infants from being baptized? It says, thou shalt not baptize infants. Well, of course not. But neither is there a verse that says, thou shalt not baptize horses. You may think, well, that's silly. Yes, it is. See, the Bible only authorizes believers to be baptized. Over and over again, we see all of those accounts in the New Testament of people who were baptized. Who were baptized? Believers. They were the only ones authorized to be baptized. So, God in his word did not have to say you cannot buy, baptize atheists, horses, fence posts, infants, or anyone else. That principle is understood. Uh, many other examples could be given of this, but this particular principle has just opened up floodgates to people doing pretty much whatever they want to in the name of religion. But as we've seen tonight, we're only allowed to do, with God's approval, what he has authorized through his word. And if we go beyond that in any way, shape, or form, we bring God's anger uh, upon us. So we cannot uh, reject this principle or abandon this principle uh, without uh, expecting God to be angry with us and bring wrath upon us for uh, not following uh, his word. I hope we've uh, been caused to think tonight about the importance of biblical authority for all that we believe uh, and practice. Thank you very much for uh, watching tonight, and Lord willing, we'll be back again next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. Thanks again.